like to uh, welcome you, John. Um, I met, first met John in 2004 uh, when he was serving as city council in Bend. Uh, and fortunately, I didn't meet him in his other role as defense attorney. <laughs> uh, when I moved over here, I went back to, to look up John, and by that time, he had disappeared. Uh, and surfaced <coughs> back at, at John Hopkins, uh, where he was going for a master's. Like, it wasn't enough that he already had a BA from um, Roanoke and had a law degree from the University of Arkansas. And then uh, he went on an odyssey, uh, two and a half years serving uh, with the Carter Center um, over in Liberia uh, to help that country uh, develop its democratic institutions. John came back um, and re-engaged working with uh, Oregon Health Clinics. And then, uh, interestingly enough, uh, became involved in civic activities again and decided to run for uh, DA in 2014. You know, life is um, short, uh, and memories are even shorter. And I don't know if we really remember the time from 2008 to 2014 when the district attorney office in this county was in shambles. Um, there was a significant disarray. Uh, and uh, John uh, didn't walk into anything but a hornet's nest. Uh, since that time, I guess you could measure it by saying that in our county, we've had 8.3% um, drop in crime, in the crime rate. Um, I suppose you could use that as a measure for John's, uh, John's work. Uh, I choose to use it in another way. Um, a is the respect that he's gained from uh, law enforcement and public officials uh, around the county, willingness to work with uh, bipartisan groups. Um, his focus on <clears throat> uh, what I would call common sense justice, um, a commitment to uh, prevention, um, programs to reduce recidivism, and uh, most of all, um, being a firm and a good manager for our resources in the district attorney's office. Um, John, welcome. By the way, that's not a campaign speech because he doesn't have an opponent this year. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. That's true, I don't have an opponent. That's, uh, I'm, I'm very uh, excited about that and happy to be um, with you here. Uh, so I, I'm going to try to move through this relatively quickly because I want to leave time for uh, questions. But I want to start, I'm going to give you some stats, some data, just so you get a sense of the, uh, the work that's done in my office. Then I'm going to talk to you about a, a program that I've uh, developed to uh, try to reduce our drug crimes. And then I'll open it up for uh, questions. So we'll get going here. All right, this is way too small, I realize now. But I'll, I'll walk you through it. Um, we handle juvenile cases and adult cases and, uh, and mental health cases. So on the juvenile cases, in the, uh, this is for the last year, there's uh, 230 juvenile delinquency cases that we've reviewed and 101 uh, juvenile dependency cases. A delinquency case is a, a crime, an alleged crime committed by a kid. And a dependency case, th those are the saddest. A kid who is uh, neglected by their parents may not be getting adequate uh, food or, or shelter. The kid, the kid is not committed a crime. The kid is uh, in danger. And so uh, 230 uh, criminal cases reviewed for kids and 101 uh, dependency cases. Okay, so adult prosecutions. This is what most people see. You see these on TV. You hear about these. Uh, 100 and, uh, 1,778 felony cases reviewed and 4,298 misdemeanor cases reviewed. So uh, total uh, 6,000 cases uh, reviewed for this most recent uh, year. So about 6,000 cases a year, criminal cases we're reviewing. We don't file charges in every case because uh, me and my deputies have to review the evidence and determine whether it's sufficient to go forward. Uh, sometimes uh, even if it is sufficient to go forward, we might say, well, that's kind of de minimis. Like, a, you know, the speed limit might be 55. Cop might see someone going 60. 
might just talk to them, give them a warning. So sometimes if it's a, a minor violation, we won't file charges. Or if we think a crime actually was not committed, we won't file charges. But about 6,000 cases a year we review. Civil commitments. This is a situation where an officer might encounter someone on the street who is in mental health uh, distress. They're not committing a crime, but they're a danger to themselves or others. The police officer can bring the person to the hospital. That's called a peace officer hold. Uh, a mental health hold might be a doctor in the hospital might see someone who's in distress, and they might hold them against their will for, for their own safety. But of course, in our country, you, you can't be held against your will. Someone just can't grab you and say, we're not going to let you go. Um, it has to be reviewed. So my office will review whether we think the, the police officer was holding someone appropriately or their doctor was holding somebody appropriately. Um, and so you'll see over you know, 500 times we review that. Seven times we had to go to a trial. And that means there was a dispute. There was a dispute between the person didn't want to be held. I thought they should be held. We went to a judge and the judge decided. So seven of those uh, mental health trials. Death investigations. I review every death that occurs in the county that is not in a medical facility. If you pass away in St. Charles, um, you know, that's not going to be reviewed by me. The doctors there will determine your cause of death. But if you die in your house, people might say, well, I mean, a, a natural death in your house, why, why are we taking time? Well, was it a natural death? But who decides? And so I review those. Now, of course, the vast majority of these more natural deaths. And I don't do this on my own. We have a medical examiner who examines the body, writes a report, law enforcement examines the body, writes a report, sends it to me. 99% of the time it's a heart attack. Or, you know, so, but occasionally it's not. But I have to review every death just to, I'm the person that certifies whether it was a natural death or not. So you can see our case number trends. We look back over the last four years. Uh, we're going, uh, going up, but uh, not much, it, it's, it's a slight, steady growth that is actually less than the population growth. So the crime rate is reducing, but when you have more people, even if your rate is less, you, you can still go up. So you see the total numbers going up, but uh, I'm, I'm comfortable with the, with the growth. Okay, so now we're gonna get into this program, which I think is pretty neat. Um, you can tell me if you agree. But uh, three years ago, four years ago when I took office, there wouldn't be a day that went by when someone didn't come up to me and say, hey Hummel, I got a great idea on how you can reduce crime. Dallas, Texas is doing this, or Seattle you know, has got this cool idea, or San Francisco is trying this, Chicago's got this neat whiz-bang thing, you should check it out. And I had a list of about 50 different cool crime prevention programs from around the country. My thought was, I'm gonna you know, read all these, study these, and pick the one that's best for Deschutes County. I'm going to implement it here, crime's going to be reduced, I'll be a hero, right? That's what I was thinking. Uh, someone <laughs> smarter than me said, uh, really smarter than me said, John, you could implement your own program. You're a new DA, you probably have a honeymoon period, you could probably get it passed, we'd give you a chance, but if the community wasn't bought into it, it eventually would well, wither and die. And then you're going to be out there with a failure on your hands. You need to involve the community in creating this. And that was smart. I was a little embarrassed. I didn't think about that. So I created this group called To Shoot Safe. I recruited people from around the county. Uh, I wanted geographic diversity, age diversity, industry diversity. We had about 30 people on this group. We met for a year. And my charge to them in the first meeting was, how can we make our community safer? That's like the biggest, biggest question you could ask. And, uh, and they ran with it. And I tell you what, the first three meetings, it was big ideas. You know, the best way to keep a community safe is to increase the high school graduation rate. The best way to keep a community safe is to have more kids reading at grade level by third grade. The best way to in in improve community safety is to reduce poverty. And I, I was like, yes, 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 those are all right. That is true. That's the way we have to do it. After a few months, I had to call the question and say, Yes, that is what we need to do. That probably needs to happen at a national level, at least a state level, well, at a minimum at a regional level. You know, my small, relatively small department, you know, can't be doing that successfully. Let, let's come up with a tangible product, because I don't want to have these committees that meet for a year, you get a nice report, and then you don't do anything. I'm like, let, yes, I agree with where we are, but we've got to narrow 
because I want to come up with something that we can implement and we can see results on. So we focused, and then the first thing we said was, well, my first push at focusing them was, how about we look at everyone who's committed a crime in Deschutes County and see what we can do to provide them services so they won't commit a crime again. Let's reduce recidivism. Because even though that's a big number, um, it's, a, it's a knowable number, it's a tangible number. So we spent a few months going down there. And, and I still, I had to call the question at the end. It's still too big, it's still too big. I said, how about this? How about we focus on the crimes that are the biggest problem in Deschutes County? And by biggest problem, I mean they're serious and they're happening a lot. I mean, murder is always gonna be the most serious crime, but thankfully it, it rarely happens in Deschutes County. You know, speeding happens a lot, but is it the biggest problem? Let's find the crimes that are happening a lot in our in our big problem, and let's focus our efforts on those. So that's where we got rocking and rolling, and uh, you'll see uh, these numbers here. We did uh, after doing a major data dive, we came down to uh, assault, DUI, domestic violence, drugs, sexual assault, and theft as the crimes that are, are, are a significant impact and are happening a lot. You see the we, we looked at uh, six years, and you see the totals. Uh, for each of these crimes. So like DUI over 6,000 times, drugs over 4,000 times, thefts uh, almost 6,000. So that was, that was a good start. We're like, okay, th that took a while to gather that data, but okay, that gave us a little something to work with. But I wanted more. I wanted to know which of these crimes, um, I wanted to know about recidivism. I wanted to know, you know, who, wh who are the people who keep coming back over and over again? And here's our recidivism chart, and this is really complicated, but I'm going to try to break it down for you. Remember, recidivism means you've committed a crime once, and then you do it again. So when you see zero, that means uh, 10,775 people committed a crime, but didn't commit it again. That's why it's zero. They didn't recidivate. Well, obviously they did it once, but recidivism is doing it again. Uh, over 4,000 people committed a crime once, but then did it again. And 2,000 did it a third time, 1,300 did it a fourth time. Look at 17 people were recidivating, you know, 17 times. And so our, that was interesting to know. Uh, this top number was interesting. 50% of people who commit a crime in Deschutes County don't commit it again. But the flip side is 50% who do it, you know, come back again. And so obviously we're getting that we're, we're successful with half of the people right out of the gate. I don't know if that's good or bad, but it's good for, for the half, but it's bad for the other half. But we wanted to know which crimes had the highest recidivism rate. So this, uh, this really jumped out at us here. Look at drugs. Um, the drug recidivism numbers go far down. The theft recidivism numbers go far down. So this, uh, this was telling us a lot here. Drugs and theft recidivism rates are super high. Look at, the, look at these numbers down here. And so that was that, that told us a lot. So we started thinking, well, drugs and theft could be what we should focus on. And this, ne this next number really did it for us. We cross-referenced uh, people who were charged with crimes. We wanted to see who was committing uh, crimes in different categories. And you look at people charged with drugs and theft, 34% of people were charged with both drugs and theft. During the uh, six years we looked at, 16% were charged with both in the same day. So that, at that point, we said we got it, that uh, we're, we're seeing drugs as a big problem, and many people who have a, a drug conviction are also committing a theft crime. So we thought if we could uh, successfully implement a program to reduce drug recidivism, we get a twofer. We think we would reduce thefts as well. So OK. But um, again, my uh, my friend is brilliant. She said, okay, Hummel, um, that's good. Um, but you had your group of 30 people, and you know, we tried our best to make it you know, representative of the county. But come on, we got 90,000 people in the county. What if your group has it wrong? What if your group thinks it's the way, this is the way to go, but the community isn't on board? So we decided to test our work, check with the community, and see if they agreed with us before we started plowing ahead with a new program. So what we did... We launched a uh, community safety survey at Portland State University <coughs> and commissioned them to you know, do a survey in the community to check what uh, people were thinking about public safety. And we had uh, six meetings around the county. At these meetings, I just showed up and said to the public who came, what do you think about public safety in the community? What are your biggest concerns? And uh, that was it, no agenda, and we, uh, we took the information. And here, here are the uh, preliminary or the, the results from that. 
Um, from the survey, what's the biggest threat to public safety in Deschutes County? Drugs uh, was the number one uh, threat. So, all right, we felt like we were on the right track there. The question, do you think public safety is being negatively impacted by street drugs? 64% uh, said a major impact. 30% said at least a minor impact, so 94%. And then this, this really got to me. I, I, I love this question. Uh, I'm going to pull it off for a minute. Uh, I should have said this there. I should have. All right. Here's a little behind the curtain thing. When you're a district attorney, you go around to conferences like all professionals do, realtors, doctors. You travel around the country, you go to conferences. And what DAs talk about, one of the things we talk about at these counties, you know, we're all elected, so you only want to know about the, your community, where you're from, and people say, are you from a tough on crime county or a soft on crime county? What's your community like? You know, San Francisco would be like more liberal, soft on crime, and I imagine uh, old parts of Dallas, not Dallas maybe, but Corpus Christi, Texas, or you know, Alabama would be tough on crime. People say, where, where, what's your community like, Hummel? Are you, Tough on crime or soft on crime? And you know, I, I always thought, I would say, you know, I, I think we're fair. We're, we're tough when we need to be, and, and we can be you know, smart and, and, and reasonable where we need to be. But I never had data on that. I mean, I've lived here, you know, for 20 plus years. I always thought that was what we were, and so that's what I would tell people. But this survey pulls it out. Like, look at this. When we ask the question, how, how should we deal with drugs? If someone's distributing drugs, meaning dealing drugs, they're a drug dealer, should we do diversion or treatment or prosecution? People, 78% say tough, prosecution. What about if someone's possessing drugs? Not dealing drugs, just is, is suffering from an addiction. Diversion, drug court, 65%, prosecution, 64%. So look at it. If you're dealing drugs, be tough. If you're someone who's suffering from an addiction, let's get you help. So that, I mean, tells me this community is just what I thought this community was. We'll be tough on people we need to be tough on, and we're going to help people that we can help. And so at that point, I said, all right, I think I know where we're going. Now I have to design this program. And uh, fortunately, I had uh, assistance from uh, uh, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. We received a grant from them with subject matter experts. It wasn't money so much, though there was some money. But it was uh, subject matter experts who helped us design this. And here's what we came up with. Uh, Goldilocks, we call it. Uh, that's my name. I think it might be a little too cute. We might need to change the name. But we call it Goldilocks because we're going to identify the intervention that's just right for each suspect. Mm -hmm. Historically, and, and I'm being a little too simplistic here, but, uh, but, but bear with me. Historically, we've treated drug crimes with the one-size-fits-all prosecution strategy. Right, you put everyone, everyone charged with a drug crime, you put them in this, in this funnel, and it comes out the other end. And what do you get? When someone was a big-time dealer, at the end of the case, we might say, gosh, that guy didn't get a long enough time in prison. And then someone who's just suffering from an addiction, not hurting anyone else except themselves and their family, they got a conviction, they got time in jail, they probably lost their job, they lost their home, and we're like, that person just needed help. Why are we so tough on them? And so too tough them. on some people, not tough enough on others. So this is the program where we're going to get the uh, intervention that's just right. Here we go. Whoa. Uh, no, no, no. I think it's good to point out with the people that suffer from addiction, too, that yeah. they may not have been criminals other than their addiction. Yes, absolutely. And if they go to jail, they will be criminals when yep. they come out. Absolutely. Absolutely. You have to be aware of the collateral consequences. You take law-abiding citizen, you put them in the system, and then uh, you're going to make them uh, more likely to become a criminal when they wouldn't have otherwise been. So here's what we got. We got three categories now. First category is clean slate. Boost is the second category. Deter is the third category. Clean slate. Officer comes upon someone uh, on the street. Um, they're not committing a crime. They're not committing theft. They're, you know, they're under the influence of a drug. Officer would usually uh, handcuff them, arrest them, take them to jail, uh, bring them into court. A year later, after maybe five court appearances and time in jail, this person would get convicted, they'd be on probation, and what would the punishment be? Well, we order you to do drug treatment. And at the end of the day, I would say, if we wanted this person to do drug treatment, why did it take a year, 10 court hearings, and this person being in jail? Why don't we just get him into treatment out of the jump? Well, that's what we do now. When that officer comes on someone, instead of handcuffing them, they say, hey, the district attorney has a new program. I think you'd be good for it. Here's a card. Go show up to the meeting Friday, 10-15. Every Friday at 10-15, I'm there. I'm there with a drug and alcohol professional, 
and a defense attorney. We get about 10 people a week that show up. I give them an overview of the program, and their program is this. Uh, if you want to go into this program, you'll have this chance. Meet with a drug and alcohol professional right now. Based on that results of that assessment, we're going to refer you to a doctor's office in town, a Mosaic Medical and Lapine Community Health Center are the providers. And if the person wants to go, they go. And once they show up to their first meeting, we verify that they show up. If they show up, um, they're never charged with a crime. They weren't charged to begin with. They were given this card to show up to the meeting. If they didn't show up to the meeting with me, we would have char charged them. If they show up to the meeting with me, and they don't show up for their first doctor's appointment, I charge them. But if they show up for that first doctor's appointment, then the case is on hold for a year. And then if they stay out of trouble, they don't get arrested, and they participate uh, with their doctor, um, they, they are never charged. Um, and, and so many things about this I love. One, it's quick entry into treatment. As opposed to court, it could take a year later. It's entry into treatment without going to jail. It's entry into treatment without um, being arrested. And this is really important. When you go through the court system and you get convicted and you're ordered to do treatment, you're ordered to do drug and alcohol treatment. But what about, imagine this. I, I, I've never suffered from an addiction. I feel fortunate to say that, but I can only imagine. Imagine if you're suffering from an addiction. Uh, you go to treatment for your addiction, and you also have untreated diabetes, or untreated hypertension, or untreated gout. It's going to be hard enough to suffer, to, to, get, to, to be successful in your addiction recovery, but if you're not getting help for your other ailments, this program, we refer you to a primary care doctor who's going to help you with your diabetes, your hypertension, your gout, your shingles, whatever you might have. And if you're suffering from an addiction to drugs, they'll get you help for that. And if you're suffering from mental health issues, they'll get you help for that. So full primary care services, cases on hold for a year. Now, if it doesn't work out, you know, it doesn't work out for some people, well then, uh, well, well then we'll handle you at, at the boost level. That's traditional prosecution. Um, you might do a couple days in jail if you're, if you're just possessing drugs and uh, you might be on probation and, and you'll still be ordered to do treatment. Now deter, that's the next level up. If you're dealing drugs in this community and you have a history of doing it, we're not doing this for, for the first offense, but if you have a second offense drug dealing, we're gonna drop the hammer on you. We're gonna seek the maximum time in prison for you. And so I'm confident that if we're getting quicker and better uh, health services for people who are using drugs, and we incapacitate drug dealers, I'm confident that the recidivism rate for drugs in this community will dramatically drop, which will then drop the uh, theft crimes. Now, that's what I believe. I believe it in my core. But this is my program. I designed it, so I can be a little biased. And so you should uh, trust my assessment of this. We have a professionals who are going to assess the results of this. And this is through the MacArthur Foundation. They'll assess it. And if this <coughs> works, you know what? We're going to keep doing it, and I imagine other communities are going to uh, adopt it. If it doesn't work, I mean, if the recidivism rate is worse with this program than what we were doing, well, we're not going to keep doing this, but we're not going to go back to what we were doing, because that the recidivism rates for that were terrible. We'll find a third way to go. I'm confident it'll work, but we'll see, and I'll keep you updated on that. As these numbers start rolling in, I'll, uh, I'll keep you updated. Uh, early on, uh, we, we have 50 people so far in that first level. 50 people are in primary care uh, right now. We've only been doing this for two months. One person is, is in level one. One person didn't make it through uh, the first level, so they dropped up to level two. We have two people who were dropping the hammer on, not because, uh, don't think I'm not dropping the hammer on people who are eligible, it's just fortunately in this two month time period, we've only had two uh, big time drug dealers come through, but everyone who meets that criteria at level three will, will be handled at level three. Um, and I'll move through, I'm just gonna move through here. I'm gonna leave time for questions, so, all right, real quick. Um, that's what we did on drug crimes, and now we're rolling that through. I want to do that same model for uh, domestic violence and impaired driving. And then once we get through those, we'll do it for other crimes too. Early on in those early meetings, people were, wanted us, people were saying, I, I appreciate this, they're all excited, but let's do something for impaired driving and, and domestic violence and drugs. You know, if you try to do everything, you'll succeed at nothing. I, I kept telling the group, no, we need to focus on one, and then we're going to focus on the next. And so domestic violence. Um, Imagine this. I was trying to figure out, of course, you know, in my first few days, how we handle all these cases. And so domestic violence, I would say, all right, how do we know what punishment to ask for? You know, this person's been convicted of domestic violence. Do 
Do I ask for eight months in jail, four months in jail, three months in jail? Do I ask for community service? If so, how much? Do I ask for a fine? So I'm asking my colleagues, so how do we do it? They say, well, what we usually do is our, we look at this case and we compare it to a previous case. You know, this guy, you know, he had this type of record and this is the type of injury he caused to his victim. You know, that's a, that's a little worse than that case we prosecuted last week. And in that case, we gave two months in jail, so we should ask for two and a half months in jail in this case. I'm like, well, did it work for the previous guy? They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, the sentence that we got, did, did, did he commit a crime again? They're like, I don't know. I'm like, well, how, how, do we, how do we know if it worked? Don't we want to do what works? And so I, I, asked, I, had my, I asked my staff, I'm like, look, find me the standards in the country, the best practice standards for domestic violence prosecution. Like, I want to know what works. I mean, th th there's jail work to deter a domestic <coughs> violence person. There's, there's a community service work. There's fines work. There's probation work. What works? The answer, I was shocked. Nobody knows this. It doesn't exist in the country. Best practices for domestic, for deterring domestic violence. I was shocked. So that has to change. I've been uh, we're talking to experts around the country. I've identified this great woman, the head of the uh, PhD nursing program at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. Top-notch expert on this. She, like we were two you know, kindred spirits, we found each other. She's like, I can't believe you're looking for that. I, I've been wanting a DA who's looking for that. I can't believe you're studying it. Let's do it. And so she's been looking for a DA's office to kind of do some, uh, some research and testing on. So we're going to partner. She's going to come out here, and we're going to do a deep data dive historically. You know, we've got thousands of domestic violence cases. <clears throat> let's see the criminal sentences we had in those cases. Let's look at the recidivism rates, and then let's try to tease out what was working and what wasn't, and then prospectively we can come up with some guidelines. So we need to do that. It's nuts to me that we don't know what works and what doesn't. And on impaired driving, there's too much of it in Deschutes County. Um, we are um, too many injuries on the roads, and, um, and, and that needs to stop. And this has been interesting. I started thinking about how do we stop this. And initially, I was thinking, well, as, as DA, well, what, what's my power, right? Jail time and punishment and tough on crime, and, sure. But as I started thinking about it, it's nuts if we're going to try to fix the impaired driving problem just from the DA's perspective. And so I've got an idea. It's early, it's nascent. I've only been thinking about this for a few weeks, but you're gonna see this discussion soon because I wanna lead a discussion in this community about how do we make Deschutes County's roads the safest roads in the country. And that's gonna be from, from a broad swath here. We need a better road design. We need traffic engineers to decide how to better design our roads. We need better lighting. We need a district attorneys to you know, better handle their cases. We need our, 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 our bars and our marijuana dispensaries to be better at detecting you know, impaired driving. We need our marketing community, right? Visit Bend, you know, and visit Central Oregon, Central Oregon you know, Tourism Association. Well, are, are we gonna be pitching, you know, come here and get drunk? Or are we gonna be pitching responsibility? Well, we need to come at it from like a large swath, not just prosecution. I'm not gonna shirk from my responsibility in this, but I want to have the community decide, because I think it'd be pretty neat if we can, you know, 10 years from now say we are have the safest roads in the country. And, and I think we can. And, and so a few people were putting a bug in my ear. They're like, well, oh, man, you're going to get pushed back from oh, you know, yeah. the beer industry and the marijuana industry. And I said, you know what? I'm leaning into this because I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I believe, look, if you own Deschutes Brewery, um, what should you say and what, what will you say? I know you believe this. You're going to say... I am a big proponent of responsible drinking. I, I'm not a proponent of irresponsible drinking. No, heck no. No, no brewery in Central Oregon is going to say they're in favor of irresponsible drinking. Because that's not true. They don't believe that. They are in favor of responsible drinking. So I would think they'd want their brand. they want to be part of this. I, I, so I think I'm going to get the brewers to uh, financially support this initiative. And same with the uh, marijuana industry. I believe in my heart that they're going to say they're in, they're in favor of responsible use by adults of marijuana, and they're opposed to irresponsible use. So they're going to fund this initiative, too. They don't know that yet, uh, but I'm going to be uh, telling them they need to fund this initiative. So um, those are some things I have in mind. I'm going to shut up now. And uh, questions? Have you had any conversations with ODOT? No. This is, I just thought about this two weeks ago, but they're going to do it. Absolutely. Yes. There are... <clears throat> Very few turn lanes, and they cause horrible accidents in See? this count. All right. Yep. So it's road, road design is a big road design might be the biggest part of this. I don't know. 
I, I, I got to look at the data and studies, but road design is going to be a big, uh, too much drinking, too much marijuana, um, lighting, education, but road design, ODOT is absolutely going to be a budget. Yeah. The only thing I'd say about any money spent on impaired driving in the next 10 to 20 years of automated vehicles yeah. with, yeah, right. Right. it's going to take care of itself. That's right. Huh. It is. You can say what you want, but we're not going to be driving in 20 or 30 years yeah. anyway. No, that's right. I, I do believe in, in 20 or 30 years, but I mean, I, I don't want people to be dying in the next 20 or 30 years, but I think you're right. I mean, the long game, we're probably okay, but for the next 20 years, still people could be dying. Yeah. Well, and I think also, I think we need to make it more aware. I, I applaud everything you're saying. Thank Absolutely, 100%. Um, but I also think that with the impaired driving um, issue and whether it's drugs or alcohol, it's why you're impaired, with us now having more options besides just a taxi service, mm -hmm. you know, or a friend, we have Uber, we have whatever, all these other options that are coming to our community. So bringing that into the conversations yeah. um, helps, I think, as well. Yeah. In your system, I know you think goal weight loss is maybe too, too childish, but <laughs> I think it's good. If you, somebody who's, who's an addict or, or has an issue, whether alcohol or drugs, you, you throw them in jail, so now they've lost their job. How are they going to pay for everything? Um, they've lost everything. So who cares? But now you're giving them a chance. That's right. The drug dealer, I say, just do it. Right, and that's right, because as I forgot what your name, but as, as this gentleman pointed out, <laughs> yeah, that, uh, uh -huh. we're talking about people who are suffering a substance use disorder and are not committing other crimes. They're not a criminal, but for the fact we've chosen to criminalize drugs. And so the best way to help that person and keep our community safe is to get them the help they need because one, if uh, we don't get them the help they need, um, you know, they might hurt themselves or others. It could be through impaired driving. Uh, but if we try to address it through jail, you, pr you put someone in jail, they're gonna meet criminals. They're also gonna have a criminal record. It might cost them their job. If they apply for housing, they're gonna have difficulty getting housing with a conviction. So somebody who wasn't otherwise a criminal we tried to help them through the criminal justice system, but we actually heard them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Alan. Uh, drug court and Goldilocks. Yes. Do they work complementary? Is one taken over the other? Yeah. Great question. Uh, uh, because of the short presentation that I whipped through, but there, there's, a more, of course, a more subtlety to this. Drug court is a program that uh, when you are charged with a crime, you're in front of a judge. It's an extensive uh, involvement from a judge. She moves you out of the regular criminal docket, puts you in a drug court docket and the judge spends uh, much time with you and you get more intense treatment. And if you complete that, um, your conviction is wiped off your record. So that still exists. That said, if we move you into the criminal justice system, you'll still have the opportunity for the drug court track. So uh, it's not an either or, but this is a case, in the drug court you have to have been arrested, taken to jail, and brought into court. And so this is uh, bypassing that. Yeah. Just one quick little idea, if you, yeah. if you guys have money, that you could give to the different breweries and bars yeah. that was to pay for somebody to be driven home by Uber or Lyft. If, if you go to somebody and tell them, I can tell that you drank too much, mm -hmm. can I call Uber and pay for it? Right. It's paid for through a program. Something like that yeah. might make that's it easier than telling them they right. have to take care of it themselves. That's and that's right. exactly right, because it, 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 again, I mean, if, if anyone's here from uh, the, the tourism group, sorry, I, I didn't meet with you first, but I literally just came up with this two weeks ago. But I'm going to be going to meet you know, with the tourism groups, and I'm going to say, it, it, it's not going to be adversarial, because I'm going to say, look, why don't, let's work together to brand this community as a safe and caring community. Maybe there's some tourism dollars that could be used for, the, for, for bars to pay for these rides. Absolutely. So it, to me, this brand is going to be great. And we, you can come here, you can have fun, but you're going to be responsible, and we're going to work as a community to keep everyone safe. So real fast, uh, it's one. So for those who want to continue to engage, please feel free. Uh, yeah, you got time? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Yeah, and if the people that I won't be offended if you got a cut. Okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs>